Tensions between Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo are resurfacing and intensifying. The DRC accuses Rwanda of backing the resurgent M23 rebel group active in its volatile east. Rwanda denies this claim. In the meantime, fighting in the eastern DRC has displaced more than 72,000 people. Could these tensions destabilize the region? We'll take an in-depth look at this simmering feud. Straight Talk Africa starts right now. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk Africa. A warm welcome to you. I'm Vincent McCory, sitting in for Haiti Adams. Now this week we'll look at the escalating tensions between two Central African neighbors, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda. East African Army chiefs held discussions Tuesday on establishing a regional military force to restore security in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo according to a statement. Now, meeting in East, Afri East DRC's commercial hub of Goma, the head of the militaries of the East African community stated that they had discussed the initial modalities of such a force without offering further details. DRC joined the East African community in March, a trade bloc that also includes Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, South Sudan, and Uganda as members. Uganda has committed troops to fight the notorious allied democratic forces in Eastern DRC on the Congolese government's invitation. But Kinshasa regularly accuses neighboring Rwanda of backing armed groups in its territory in pursuit of its own aims. Rwanda denies the claims and has in turn accused Congo's army of fighting alongside the democratic forces for the liberation of Rwanda, an armed group founded by ethnic Hutus who fled Rwanda after participating in the 1994 genocide. Now, the DRC and Rwanda maintain radically different positions as to the reasons behind their feud. To get some clarity on the different perspectives, let's, fir let's first hear from Anastasia Tudish in Kinshasa. It's clear there is no doubt Rwanda has supported the M23 rebels to come and attack the DRC. Those are President Chisekedi's first public remarks on the ongoing conflicts in the eastern part of the country. As he was visiting Congo Brazzaville's president, Denis Sassou Nguesso, a few days ago, Mr. Chisekedi stressed that a peace-seeking attitude should not be mistaken for weakness. On the field, the Congolese army has reported clashes between the M23 rebels and the national forces in the Ruchuru territory in the beginning of the week, saying that the rebels have been beaten in two locations and the national forces are gaining power and territory. In that context, very good news for the Congolese Catholic community as Kinshasa and Rome has announced that Pope Francis's visit in the DRC scheduled next month is maintained, including a pastoral activity in Goma, the North Kivu main city, a visit under the sign of a reconciliation and compassion, according to the two entities. The DRC is Africa's first Catholic country, sixth in the world. Meanwhile, in Kinshasa, a group composed of the main civil society organizations is scheduling protest actions for the days to come in the capital. Anastasi Tudiesh for VOA News, Kinshasa. And now let's cross over to Rwanda. Here is reporter Eugene Uwimana in Kigali. The position of the Rwandan government remains unchanged. Rwanda categorically denies allegations made by the DRC that it supports the M23 group in eastern DRC. Recently, Rwanda's envoy to the UN, Ambassador Clay Vagatete, said the allegations are baseless. He therefore urged the UN Security Council to help break what he called a dangerous alliance of the FRDC, the Congolese Army, and the FDAR rebel group. FDAR is a rebel group made of genocidians who fled Rwanda in 1994. Recently, the chairperson of the African Union and the president of Senegal, Macky Sall, said he was gravely concerned by the situation. He also said he made several phone calls with both presidents. 
Paul Kagame of Rwanda and Felix Tshisekedi of the DRC, urging them to find a peaceful way of mending their bilateral relations. When you move around Chigari City, you can say that Rwandans are least concerned by these tensions. However, there are concerns that these tensions will destabilize the regional integration and cross-border trade. Ejen Uwimana for VOA News, Chigari, Rwanda. Well, thanks, Anastasia and Eugene, for those reports. Now, for an in-depth look into the DRC Rwanda situation, I'm joined by our guests via Skype from South Africa, Kwesi Mkibisa, Research Fellow, Center for Africa Diplomacy and Leadership, University of Johannesburg, Pretoria. And via Skype from Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Claude Gatebuke, Executive Director, African Great Lakes Action Network. A warm welcome to both of you. Thank you for having me. Yes. Now, thank you. I, I want to begin in South Africa, and I know I butchered your second name big time, Kwesi. But uh, first, as a person who analyzes security and looking at this conflict from kind of from the outside, inside, uh, how much of a threat do you see this is regionally for the sake of, you know, the peace and unity of the Central, East and Central African region? Thank you very much, uh, Vincent. Um, indeed, I mean, um, as an outsider looking in, um, it is uh, something to be concerned about. Uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, for all the statistics of potential and all of the statistics of human, economic, social, and stability costs, is an important country where one development or a number of development will have a ripple effect. Um, when some of us were observing uh, the developments, uh, uh, we use a lens which we call a regional conflict system. Uh, it's when an event in one country actually impacts on a number of its neighbors. And what has happened, which is basically the breakdown of this conflict, of this peace process, or at least the detente or coming together of finding dialogue uh, between the DRC and uh, Rwanda as part of a broader regional effort, it's worrying. It is taking back uh, the confidence that had been built in order to find solutions to issues such as uh, improving trade, such as improving uh, transboundary governance, uh, and a whole range of other issues. So we should be, we should be worried, and we should be uh, making sure that our focus encourages not just simply the two countries, but the region as a whole, to lend a hand wherever they can. Yes, and I have to mention that we had uh, some technical issues. We couldn't be joined by another uh, friend uh, who is actually native of the DRC. But uh, uh, Claude, I want to come to you. And, uh, you know, for, uh, as a person also from the region, let's first go back in time. Because when people see what's happening now, uh, you know, they may just uh, kind of uh, reach conclusions on the basis of the recent uh, news report. But what is the genesis of the conflict between or the feud between the DRC and uh, and Kigali. Uh, the the genesis actually goes way way back to 1981 in Uganda when uh, Museveni, the president of Uganda, currently uh, started a war uh, with the NRM, the Na uh, National Resistance Movement, which is the party in power in Uganda. He, along with many Rwandan refugees. Uh, were able to win that war in 1986 and take over Uganda. And then in 1990, uh, Museveni, along with others on the uh, outside of Rwanda, sponsored a rebellion into Rwanda that brought the RPF, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, uh, into Rwanda. They fought a four-year war that culminated in the genocide in 1994. And uh, the RPF won the war. Uh, millions of people fled Rwanda at the time, uh, many of them going into the DRC, at least a million and a half went into the DRC, which was uh, almost a quarter of the population of Rwanda at the time. And then um, from there, uh, Rwanda started expressing uh, security concerns. Uh, then uh, in 1996, uh, so it started with the NRM, then the RPF. In 1996, a rebellion was formed uh, called the AFDL. Again, it was by Rwanda and Uganda uh, sponsoring uh, former President Kabila of the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, to fight a war to oust uh, longtime dictator uh, uh, Mobutu Sese Seko. 
uh, and then uh, the AFDL one took over the Congo, and then there were other rebel groups that were born mm -hmm. out of the AFDL uh, called the RCD that transformed into the CNDP, and now today we have the M23. However, the issues of the Congo go hundreds of years back because yeah. these these are this is the legacy of not only uh, the regional conflicts but also colonialism. And and uh, and. <laughs> Incidentally, actually, the king of Belgium, uh, the country that uh, colonized the Congo and, and really, uh, you know, had uh, imposed a, a reign of terror, is visiting the DRC. Uh, we may touch on that, but I want to stay a little bit with you, Claude. Um, so it's very clear from what you have stated that, uh, the, you know, Rwanda, the DRC, and Uganda have actually been friends in over time, trying to find peace, trying to, uh, you know, even even achieve democracy. Uh, so uh, we, we look at the reality. The fact is that the, this was never always a, a relationships of animosity. But uh, what would you say uh, has made it difficult for these countries to eventually become really more uh, uh, coexist more peacefully? Uh, than would be desired by the people of the region? The peaceful coexistence actually was there prior to 1996 when both Rwanda and Uganda invaded uh, the, the Congo. What is the issue um, that fuels this uh, conflict is the greed. Not only um, there's, so there's an issue of uh, uh, leadership in the Congo and governance in the Congo. However, there's also the issue of interference by both neighbors, Rwanda and Uganda, into the Congo. That's that's basically made it impossible for Congo to stabilize. Of course, uh, they don't just invade and take over the Congo. They are extracting resources and they are exporting minerals that are not found in both countries and enriching especially people in the leadership of those countries. Uh, and in addition, uh, these aren't, they aren't acting alone. Uh, Rwanda and Uganda are heavily backed by uh, Western sponsors, the US and the, and the UK and the European Union. All of these have made it impossible for a peaceful coexistence because the people themselves are friendly. The people themselves are sisters and brothers, but the leadership in the countries plus the geopolitical situation in the Congo and its resources that are the mm -hmm. fuel our appetite, the, the feed our appetites uh, are fueling this impossible, uh, this conflict. Uh, and no. so today what we have is just a continuation of an occupation of the Congo in order to extract the resources. Uh, Kwesi, uh, you have been studying the situation, the issue in this, in the Great Lakes region. In terms of uh, the claims that Rwanda makes, and Rwanda is a smaller country, so sometimes, of course, it says it needs to be concerned about its security. Uh, what would you make of the accusations against the DRC that it actually harbors uh, people, groups of people, who committed genocide, and over these years, these people have been a threat to Rwanda. I mean, it's a it's a it's a long-standing uh, uh, accusation. It's a long-standing concern. It is genuine. Um, I think the the reality of the matter. I think, as Claude has indicated, the fact that uh, when Rwanda was actually um, the RKF had found expression in the country. Those who are known as genocidaires crossed over into the DRC. And the relations between the two countries uh, never sought to go not to the heart of the problem, but to resolving uh, the existence of these genocidaires in their historical as well as in the contemporary uh, context. So the concerns of Rwanda have always been genuine. Um, what we as observers who are actually understanding the level of investment that Rwanda has put in military terms to respond to the threat of these genocides in historical and contemporary terms. We have not found it to be um, uh, equal or to be equaled by the efforts of actually ensuring an environment back in Rwanda that would uh, uh, respond to now the, the offspring of those original genocides to actually be part of this new democratic Rwanda that is stable, that is socially cohesive, and that plays a role in, in, in regional and, and, and continental politics. Uh, whenever we are looking into the situation of is the threat of genocides 
more than the, the, the opportunities there are for Rwanda to actually welcome its own citizens or children or their offspring, we have found problems in actually uh, reaching that conclusion. Because we, we see a military response, we see a regional posture uh, that seeks to go and, and, and find out all those that threaten the country. But we don't see, on the other hand, an equal measure of investment on actually saying that where are these other Rwandese that had actually run away and had committed genocide? Because Rwanda has had a very uh, uh, credible process of, 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 of transitional justice for those that had been identified as genocides. But they, it only exercised and executed that transitional justice program to the Rwandese that were found in the country, but not those that were found outside. And I think that uh, for those of us who have been observing for quite a while, these are some of the contradictions in terms of investment, in terms of uh, uh, commitment. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of uh, support of this uh, different rebel groups, you know, Rwanda, uh, you know, accuses the DRC of supporting ADF, uh, which threatens it, and of course the FDLR. And on the other side, uh, the DRC, you know, accuses the Rwanda of supporting M23. Uh, so the question is, uh, at this, uh, has there been an interest in each country, you know, kind of uh, working to uh, neutral, not only neutralize, but perhaps attain some peaceful resolution to these threats from all the, the forces that we have mentioned? Uh, uh, if I may stay, stay with you uh, in South Africa, Kwesi. Um Indeed, this has been one of the criticisms of the multiple uh, and billions of, of U.S. dollars of investment in the peace processes in the in the in the Great Lakes region. Is that our our lens has almost always defined domestic issues in terms of their manifestation in regional stability terms. Um, we we have seen um, and, and the presidents of, of of Rwanda and, um, and the DRC playing a part, or at least um, uh, acknowledging. Uh, the fact that domestically there is still a lot of work to be done, despite the fact that regional actors such as Kenya in the form of the Nairobi uh, 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 Accord and, and, and the International Conference of the Great Lakes, the Economic Community of uh, Central African State, have all come to assist them find a lasting solution for a restive region. Uh, what has been lacking is indeed what you are pointing out, at, which is what are the domestic arrangements that need to be in place in order for these countries to exercise in a sovereign, in a fully sovereign manner, their country's contribution in making sure that the region is, is stable. What we have found, I mean, from, from studying the, the, the conflict, and of course, even these new uh, counter accusations, uh, two things, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, firstly, the, 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 the definition of one country supporting another country's rebel, rebellion through support to rebel groups is not entirely materialistically justifiable. Primarily because the reason why the DRC is not in a position to put a final end to the existence of the FDLR is because there are no arrangements in Rwanda to ensure that the former gen genocides who are currently organized as the FDL FDLR in uh, the DRC would actually find a, an environment that would be accepting and that will be inclusive, and that will enjoin them to the stability of the country. Vice mm -hmm. versa, the inability of the DRC as a country to ensure that they have got an, extend, an extension of its sovereignty beyond Kinshasa and other metropoles, but to the rest of the North Kivu region, ensures that because there isn't a, an extension of governance, a, that region becomes a playground for almost all other tendencies. This mm -hmm. might not necessarily mean that it is the designs of Rwanda to have a disruptive element and vice versa. And uh, thank you. And, and Claude, yes, I want to uh, jump in and, and you may want to comment or re respond to that, but I also wanted to ask you additionally, uh, do you see, do these rebel groups uh, at the different countries, or uh, the two countries actually, in a way maybe okay or just uh, kind of okay with them existing to use them as leverage in some way? Um, I will start with uh, with your question, uh, and I do. I would like to to uh, clarify some of the things that uh, that Paisi, uh has spoken about. Uh, one is yes, I think it's very convenient for these uh, two countries to have these rebel groups and use them as leverage. Uh, and in fact, in fact, uh, for both the Congo and Rwanda with the FDLR, I think it's a convenient force because 
There's only hundreds of FDLR fight fighters, but this war has gone on for decades. Um, and uh, the other thing is, you know, with the Congo, um, they have shown no, in no incentive to actually uh, neutralize the various forces in the in the country. However, it is a destabilized country, and for many years, and with with heavy forces. Now, when it comes to the current M23, it has been shown uh, in previous years, uh, in various documents and evidence, that generals that report to Paul Kagame, his top advi military advisor, General James Kabarebe, General Charles, Charles Kayonga, and General Charles uh, uh, Jack Nziza were sponsoring and uh, providing uh, logistics, recruiting, and providing funds to the M23. Additionally, refugees that went into the Congo are not genocidaires. They were women and children. Many of them died there. Some of the people who went to the Congo committed the genocide, and that is what who should be held yeah. accountable. However, that, however, yeah. it is not correct to state that those who ran to the Congo were genocidaires. There was over a million and a half people that actually ran there. I went to that to to, to the Congo, fled to the Congo after surviving the genocide in Rwanda. The other thing in Rwanda, Rwanda exports terrorism, not just to the Congo, but to other countries, including South Africa, including here in the US, a yeah. Freedom House report just came out showing how they abducted Paul Rusesa Bagina back to Rwanda. They are coming after people like me. They accuse us, Paul Rusesa Bagina saved people during the genocide. I survived the genocide, but they accuse us of denying the genocide, no. basically they weaponized the genocide as blackmail, not only inside of the country, but outside of the country mm -hmm. and justifying the violence in the Congo. And I think that is, uh, that, that, that should be uh, now, made, made, made clear. Now, Claude, I'm sure, you know, you know what you've experienced, you know what you've gone through, but also we know that uh, Rwanda denies most of uh, the accusations, especially of uh, sponsoring M23 and even uh, the kind of direct mention of some of the generals that you just mentioned, uh, Rwanda categorically says it does not support that group. And we don't have uh, officials from both governments to kind of uh, verify some of those. Uh, so we, we, we just know that uh, that's their position, that they do not uh, support. And of course, the DRC also claims it does not support ADF or FDLR. Those are the official positions of this government. Well. Uh, we want to take a, a short break, and then when we come back, we'll look at uh, the different efforts that are being made at the moment by the East African community, uh, the, the kind of approach they're having in order to resolve this issue. So let's go uh, for a short break, and we'll be right back. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. Well, today we are talking about uh, the recent tensions between the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda. Our guests are Kwesi Mkibisa, Research Fellow, Center for Africa Dip Diplomacy and Leadership, University of Johannesburg, uh, Pretoria. And Claude Gatebuke is Executive Director, African Great Lakes Action Network. Welcome back. Now, I just wanted to go to uh, the regional efforts uh, that are, we are witnessing lately. You see, um, I wanted to go to a recent meeting that happened in uh, Goma, the city of Goma, where uh, the armed forces of the East African community uh, met there, and um, they wanted to, they were discussing the situation in the DRC, 
with the objective of establishing a regional joint force. And here is what uh, Celestine Bala, head of the Congolese Armed Forces, had to say. All local armed groups active in the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, should participate unconditionally in the political process to integrate a program of disarmament, demobilization, community rehabilitation and stabilization. Failing this, they will be consequently pursued by the sub-regional force. Well, that was uh, Celestine Bala, head of the Congolese Armed Forces. Also attending the security meeting in Goma was General Robert Kibochi, head of the Kenyan Armed Forces. We, as the defense, defense chiefs, have been mandated to implement the EAC heads of state's decisions for the establishment of a regional force to help contain and, where necessary, fight the negative forces. This mandate requires of us to fully understand the underlying issues to the conflict towards the development of necessary response mechanisms. Well, gentlemen, uh, we want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, those uh, utterances by those military men there. This. This is significant. The reason why I wanted to listen to this uh, is because uh, this is a new dispensation in the region. The DRC and Rwanda, actually the newest members of the East African community. And now we're seeing the militaries of the region coming together to figure out how best to neutralize the threat uh, that uh, face those both countries, Rwanda and the DRC. So let me, let me start with you, Kwesi. What do you make of that? new uh, kind of uh, chapter that uh, the DRC and Rwanda find themselves in as members of the East African community? Well, I mean, you are, you are quite right, Vincent. It is a, a new chapter. But the development of uh, there being a, a direct military uh, 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 confrontation approach is not entirely new when it comes to the DRC. We will all recall that um, uh, almost a decade ago, uh, under the agencies of the United Nations, uh, the Southern African Development Community nations of South Africa, Malawi, and Tanzania uh, formed part of a rapid reaction force, um, which is popularly known as the International Force Brigade. Uh, this meant that uh, through under 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 the, the framework of, of, of international cooperation in found in expression of the, the United Nations deploying there, there would now be a capability to actually uh, do away with the negative forces. But not only under the United Nations and the regional bodies such as SADC, which only uh, the D, uh, which only the DRC is a member of, but also the cooperation, uh, or rather a bilateral framework, which is the cooperation between the Congolese Army and the UPDF, which is the, the Armed Forces of Uganda, in Operation Shuja, which is looking at actually uh, um, giving expression to a military response to the ADF. So it is quite interesting that um, the e East African community at this point in time sees value, because they wouldn't have taken that decision if they didn't see value. What do they see value in? They see value in actually contributing to the approach of the DRC government, which is threefold. You will all recall that um, the, East, the, the DRC government, in response to the restive nature of the Eastern DRC, not TV specifically, has almost said that it wants to negotiate. It wants to ensure that uh, if there's those negotiations lead uh, to progress, there will be some dis dis disarmament and demobilization. And as we had uh, in your clip, in the introductory clip, uh, a community rehabilitation. But lastly, it does not necessarily repudiate the right of the state to actually deal with these negative forces in, with, with a military response. Now, it appears as if there is almost a, not a sanction only, but an endorsement, a, a, a commitment to support. Because I think the, the East African community, with a more economic integration orientation, understands the economic benefit of the participation of the DRC and the strategic nature of the Eastern DRC in the economic output and opportunity of the DRC. Mm -hmm. So this is not entirely new, but we need to say that there has to be caution. Studies that yeah. have been done on these sorts of responses have shown that without a concomitant uh, uh, socio-economic and developmental response, uh, we will never finish the problems of the uh, of the Eastern DRC and, and, and such like situations 
only with a military response. Yes. Uh, so uh, now, Claude, of course, military response is not a new thing, but I think what is really new <laughs> is that uh, now the Rwandan DRC find themselves as members of the East African bloc, uh, which means now they become brothers, they can sit around the table. Do you see the hope now in the peace, in lasting peace in the Eastern Congo and also the relationship between uh, the DRC and Rwanda in their membership? Because they have uh, a place now where they can sit around the table uh, with their counterparts and talk about the situation there, both militarily now and of course at a political and diplomatic level. Uh, the hope lies uh, further beyond just the East African uh, community. Um, and I'll echo the words of uh, Dr. Mukwege, Nobel Peace Prize winner from the Congo, who has been treating women affected by major atrocities in the Congo. He says that um, there cannot be lasting peace unless there is justice. And I 100% agree. It has, there has to be, eventually, there has to be justice in order for it there to actually be lasting peace. And a starting point would be for the perpetrators who committed, uh, who have committed uh, crimes in the Congo, especially the major ones, to be held accountable. The starting point would be the UN mapping report that was released in 2010 uh, that documents the most serious incidents only the most serious incidents, and they documented more than 600 incidents. Uh, those are major atrocities, and if they so, continue to go so, unpunished, so in, that, impunity, in that case, do you see yeah. the East African community being able now to bring these countries to the table and really, uh, with the help of the, of the international community, address those issues? Because that's the issue now. Let's, let's throw out uh, accusations and counter accusations, but talk about how do you, do you face these issues now under the auspices of the East African community? Do you see that as now being the most viable tool and uh, possibly most promising at the moment? It would only be the most viable tool if they set up a tribunal to actually try those crimes. Of course, because many of the leaders in, the, in, in those meetings, especially maybe not the military leaders, uh, some of them for sure, but the political leaders in Rwanda, in Congo, in Uganda would be affected. I think it may be hamstrung to actually set up such a tribunal. But I do think if they set up a, tri a tribunal, a criminal tribunal to go after those who committed those crimes in the Congo, the East African community would offer the greatest hope to, uh, to, to lasting peace in the Eastern DRC. Uh, less than that, I think it's going to be a repeat of uh, the usual. And I, I also think that it could affect the proceedings with, uh, within the East African community because previously, roles between Burundi and Rwanda, when Rwanda was a chair of the East African community, prevented even having meetings because they needed to have a certain number of, uh, of attendants and countries in attendance, and there was never enough. And so they went for, I believe it was two years, without having a meeting. So even those meetings, if these roles continue, may not happen. But again, I think the hope of the Congolese lies in establishing the truth and justice for the victims of those who have been uh, harmed and those who have uh, been killed, millions of Africans, more than six million. Uh, if there is justice, I see a hope uh, for, uh, for the Congolese and for the region. And it could thrive because Congo matters. The resources of the Congo could feed the whole continent. So just imagine if, if just even a portion of that was benefiting the East African community, it would be amazing. Yes. Uh, but I think it starts with justice. Now, Kwesi, you know, uh, the continent, uh, there's been uh, all these efforts to unify the entire continent, but starting with regional blocks. We have SADC, we have ECOWAS, uh, we have the East African community, and, and many have actually seen the East African community, especially in the past, as being, uh, you know, uh, perhaps the best model of both economic integration and hopefully a political integration. But uh, some wonder, can you really attain uh, that kind of uh, integration and unity if you have members that don't like each other that much, have so many issues? Uh, who will listen to who? Does the East African community have the structures that can really hold itself accountable, that can help to resolve serious, serious issues like what exists between the DRC and Rwanda, and sometimes 
even Uganda and other countries? Um, that, that, that is really the question, uh, Vincent. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm relatively hopeful, um, um, and I'll state why. One central uh, reason for that. Uh, much of the progress that we've seen on the continent when it comes to how to integrate our developmental and peace and security agendas under one regional economic community or, or, or a regional bloc um, uh, were actually copied from the East African community. Uh, when we're looking at expanding um, the, the layers of accountability of our countries towards a continental vision, we copied that from the East African community. They were the very first entities that actually had um, a, a, a parliamentary a representative, a representative a chamber or a structure that would actually see more Africans beyond the leadership playing a role. And lastly, the, another reason why I'm quite hopeful is that we, we tend to think that things only happen when heads of state talk to each other and meet. The meeting that took place in Goma with the chiefs of the military signifies for me the ongoing confidence building mechanisms of entities, very critically important entities in finding lasting peace in the DRC and the region, which is the military. If there is a layer of consistent confidence building, cooperation, communication, and meeting, uh, this is the base. These are the very same people who actually give their heads of state and by extension their governments and countries the, the, the green light on capabilities to harm each other, on capabilities to make compromises, on capabilities to actually ensure the sovereignty of the country. So these are some of the structures that have almost always been there, these of confidence building in the peace and security structure. If the East African community would learn from the mistakes of other regional entities, and here I would mention SADC, I would mention the International Conference of the Great Lakes, I would also include the economic community of East African states, where they thought that defining their contribution in regional terms would give lasting solutions. What the East African community would have to do differently will be to make sure that they continue to put emphasis on the normative frameworks of governance and, as Claude has indicated, justice of, 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 of humanitarian relief, psychosocial assistance, and a whole range of them that they actually have concepts around in order to make sure that they help individual member countries so that we would actually be seeing the EAC as convening sensible, sober, and indeed socially progressive governments who have actually done these sort of things that they would like to see in the region, in their own countries first. Now, uh, Getabuka, uh, we saw the chairman of the current chairman of the African Union, Makisal, the president of Senegal, call on these uh, two countries to kind of sit and talk. And uh, he also asked the president of Angola, uh, Joao Lorenzo, to mediate between the two. So uh, first, this kind of a uh, it takes the East African countries uh, uh, and, and, and takes them almost to the south uh, to have some kind of other forms of negotiations there. Uh, one would have expected them to be asked to go to Arusha <laughs> to, to talk to Tanzania or Kenya. So the question is, we do have this dual, I don't know if you call it, it's a dual efforts of uh, unifying the continent. There's the Africa Union and then there's the, the, the regional bloc. So in this case, uh, with the kind of priorities you have in mind, what role does the Africa Union play in this regional, uh, you know, feuds between countries that belong to a regional bloc? Uh, the African Union, I, I think, um, the 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 challenge is similar. Um, so uh, I, I like how Quasi um, talked about the various regional integrations. I, I believe, I, the way, from my view, Southern Africa, the SADC has done really well, and ECOWAS has done really well. Uh, and Makisal being from Senegal, I actually applaud what Senegal has done uh, in Nigeria and other, other uh, some of the others in ECOWAS, but especially Senegal and in Nigeria. They have shown leadership in regional issues. Uh, I would go back to when Yaya Jeme in Gambia refused to leave after losing uh, the presidential election. Uh, and Senegal said, no, we're going to hold you accountable to it. I think uh, that is what's lacking both within the African Union and also the East African community, where uh, leadership in the community basically says, you know, Rwanda, uh, Paul Kagame, you're waiting seven in Uganda, stop invading the Congo or there will be uh, regional consequences. 
But I think the African Union, uh, one of the things that they've done uh, previously that's worked well is is is, is uh, excluding coal makers. So what if the African Union said, okay, if you invade another country, we will exclude you from uh, the African Union and the East African community if they do that. I think those are some of the things that are in place that can be very helpful, but there has to be consequences for actually causing harm to our fellow sisters and brothers. Uh, whatever the reason may be, it is not right for a country to invade the sovereignty of another country to support rebels into uh, that, that are fighting into another country. And so I think if there are consequences at those levels, not just talks, I do think the talks could help. But we've seen where it talks, you know, there's talk here and there's war on the other side. There's talk here with the ICGLR, for example. You know, that was set up to deal with those conflicts. They have yeah. talks, but they still have conflicts. So I think there has to be accountability and consequences at those levels. And I do think that the African Union can play a hopeful role in the East African community also. Yes. And um, Kwesi, uh, going back to Rwanda and, and, and the DRC's situation, uh, you know, the DRC deals with a, a kind of a, I think it's a, the comp, it's a little bit more complex than many people may realize. For example, M23 is really a homegrown rebellion. This is a group that is from the DRC. And, and then at the same time, the DRC is accused by Rwanda of harboring two rebel groups, the ADF that they say is also very closely uh, associated with the FDLR. So what would be the best approach in this case? Because these groups all exist in the DRC. None of them is in Rwanda. Well, fundamentally, the reality of the matter is that um, this year, it's year 2022, which is almost 20 years since the signature of the breakthrough talks. Um, some might call it uh, the Sun City talks or the, 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 the national dialogue of the DRC that occurred as a result of the Lusaka and Addis Ababa agreement. Since those 20 years and the delivery of the Pretoria Agreement back then, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo has had successive elections, but not necessarily addressing a very key component of that agreement in the requirement for governance, which is local government. Almost all of the grand or national, regional and continental um, attention to issues of regional stability, continental stability, or contributions of the DRC to economic integration efforts will not find expression, and, and sustainably so, if the DRC itself, as part of its development of governance uh, mechanisms and structures, doesn't go and seeks to have representation at the lowest level, where you expand the governance cake, where you expand government sovereignty, not upwards, but actually to in depth in terms of, of, of the population. All of the, the plans and, and all of the suggestions and all of the experiences of the past will not prove to be land because we will not be in a position to actually satisfy the needs, the conflict definition aspect, the aspiration of the Congolese, uh, but we'll only be dealing with what the politicians, what the military people are actually seeking to see as an outcome. So for, for, for me, sitting here, having looked at the DRC, a very big proponent, yes, there are fits and starts, there are two steps forward and perhaps three steps backward. Until we actually start on extending and expanding the governance foundation of the Democratic Republic of Congo, none of these other issues that we're talking about are going to add towards uh, finding a lasting solution. Yeah. Uh, Claude, uh, you know, the DRC has said that it allowed Uganda to actually uh, enter into the country to pursue ADF. Uh, why would this be a problem if uh, Rwanda goes into the DRC to pursue FDLR? And that agreement was signed much to the chagrin of the Congolese people in the region because they know the history of the Ugandans in that region with the massacres in Ituri and so many other places when Uganda invaded the, uh, the Congo along with the Rwanda. Um, and also, um, the, the issue of um, Rwanda invading the DRC, uh, I would like to add to what you said. The M23 is a mixture of uh, homegrown and exported forces because satellite pictures have shown, satellite evidence has shown camps, military camps from Rwanda pass all the way to the camps of the M23. 
There's also active recruitment of uh, school children and people being abducted in Rwanda to go and be part of the M23. And these is our, our sisters and brothers. Uh, so the issue with why is it a problem for Rwanda to invade the Congo to go after the FDLR is, first of all, if the FDLR is not inside of Rwanda, why is it a problem? For why does Rwanda need to be in the Congo and be present in the Congo? Rwanda has not had a war since the well, 90s. Well, well, this is the, the argument. Rwanda, is, Rwanda will make the ag I mean, Rwanda will make the argument that the FDLR is organizing and uh, is a potential threat. And uh, Kagame, President Paul Kagame, says Rwanda is a small country. They ha it has to worry about its security, and if uh, the FDLR continues to organize and and uh, and grow stronger, it could potentially become a major threat. You would have wars all over the continent if you followed that logic. And more than those six million uh, innocent people that's been killed in the Congo, it will be maybe triple or even more the amount. If every country said, whatever country decided and said, you have 300 or 600 fighters in your country that are against me, so I'm gonna come after you. Um, and I'm gonna come and invade your country. Uh, the the Rwanda doesn't just accuse Congo of harboring the FDLR. It accuses multiple countries. So should Rwanda now invade Zambia, for example, and Mozambique, and a bunch of other Southern African countries because uh, it says that they have FDLR members in those countries? I don't think so. Any kind of uh, there is no justification for a country leaving their own borders. Rwanda can protect their own borders. That's great. Just protect your borders. Leave the Congolese alone. Every time, and by the way, the agreements between uh, Uganda and Congo has also happened b before with the Rwandan forces in Umoja Way to one and Umoja Way to uh, two in, uh, um, in in Congo between Kabila and Kagame. They signed the agreement, allowed Rwandan troops to go into the Congo, and they went and committed massacres against Congolese people. The Congolese people protested. There is a reason why you have protests all over the world, not just in Congo but in Europe, in America, and so many other parts of the world where Congolese are protesting against Rwanda's occupation mm -hmm. of the Congo is because it is harmful to the people and it's not a solution. No country should be allowed to go beyond their own borders to go and fight a group outside of uh, the, the, uh, their own borders. And by the way, go over there and commit massacres, not even fight that group. Now, They've done this for 26 years and no result. They cannot continue doing that. So now the East African community wants to change the dynamics here. But Kwasi, you know, one of the things that is so heart-trenching that really makes anybody's heart bleed is the suffering of the people, especially in the Eastern uh, Congo, Eastern DRC. Uh, we've seen thousands, hundreds of thousands displaced over the years. Women have been raped, children have been left orphans. Uh, and, and, and women, of course, widows. Uh, uh, Claude mentioned that one of the most important things that has to be done is justice. First, Kwesi, do you, do you get the sense that uh, the people of the Eastern DRC have been ignored, uh, not only by the authorities there, but the region and the continent over all these years? Um, direct, honest question, yes, they have been. Um, in research uh, circles, uh, policy uh, advocacy circles, we, we, we look at the Congo um, and actually come to almost an agreement that uh, the, the violence, especially in the Eastern DRC, is cyclical. And if, if not almost predictable, it's all, that train is never late. It, it, we, we already know um, uh, the patterns of, 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 of hostilities uh, between negative groups and the government. We already can predict uh, when are going to be efforts at a, dif at, at a diplomatic solution. We, we know the difference um, of, of, of how communities, women, children, um, are, are subjected to untold suffering uh, during the rainy season when these um, uh, troops and those with military equipment cannot move because of the rain, but uh, uh, would actually entrench themselves. And we already know all of these things. Indeed, the region, the continent has actually uh, uh, not done well towards uh, the, 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 the Congolese and especially the Eastern TRC. Uh, but, I mean, they, they followed on uh, us as a, as a region and, a, and as a continent. They followed on uh, to the patterns of focus on the DRC uh, that we have seen globally. 
I mean, uh, uh, currently almost everybody talks of a very important, serious situation in, uh, in the conflict between uh, 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 Russia and Ukraine. And almost everybody is looking at the resources that are, are being adequately rationed towards that particular conflict, both in humanitarian, in migration, and other terms. But the, the glaring and almost always unattended situation in terms of need in, in the Eastern DRC continues to be what it is, a human, a horrible story. And I think that um, with Claude and the network and, and the great work that they do, uh, putting pressure on a continuous basis that we cannot, as Africans, allow uh, for the ongoing treatment, light-hearted treatment, light-hearted investment um, of, of the situation in the Eastern DRC uh, as anywhere else on the continent to, to, to continue un, un, unanswered by our mm. leadership and yeah. those with the resources. Yes. Now, Claude, you know, people say it's very easy for the DRC government to always look over and blame uh, Rwanda for this or Uganda for that. Uh, but uh, it has failed the people of the Eastern DRC. I mean, it may have failed people in other areas, in other forms. But many people say the government of Kinshasa, the successful government, have really not done well by the people of uh, their country. What's your thought on that? Um, I partially agree because many uh, multiple governments in the Congo have uh, failed the Congolese people because uh, the way they've governed is very self-serving and trying to perpetuate themselves in power, which is an issue in the whole region, by the way, again, with the, the changing of constitutions and presidents wanting to extend their, their terms, uh, rigged elections, uh, and, and Kwesi talked about uh, even just uh, local government, local go governance. So the, the Congolese government has uh, failed the people. but. At the same time, on, on the same hand, if you look at the Ukraine right now and what's going on there, I'm glad that example came up. Would you say credibly that the Ukrainian government has failed the people, considering that it's under siege? Uh, and so that is what's going on in the Congo also. Uh, you cannot completely ignore that your neighbors are not simply yeah, meddling. Yeah. They're the, coming the thing your country is, and massacring the thing so. millions of people. Internally, uh, though, you know, they do say that they say the plundering of the wealth of the Congo, of course, by external forces, but also by the locals, by some of the politicians over the years, way back from the time of Mobutu Sese Seko up to today. Uh, and there have been, of course, insurgencies within, you know, remember the Mai Mai groups and all that. Yeah. Yeah. The people of the Congo that I speak to say they see this uh, leaders, these politicians really helping themselves, but really not too empathetic with the suffering of the people in the DRC while there is external interference, but also locally, both uh, when it comes to security, but even development and the sharing of the wealth of the country. Definitely, definitely. If you look at the, the, the easiest examples, the two easiest examples are looking at Kabila and his family's wealth. Uh, which is much publicized, hundreds of millions of uh, money swindled in so much, such a big uh, business empire for themselves that has not served the people where civil servants are not paid. You look, you go back to Mobutu's time, the soldiers, the military was not paid, the civil servants were not paid, but he had billions of dollars in his accounts. So the plundering for sure is not simply done by the outsiders, it's also done by the, uh, by the Congolese themselves, the, the Congolese leaders, not the Congolese people necessarily, and those who are around the circles of power. Beyond Rwanda and Uganda, there is also plundering by the multinationals all over the world, uh, Canada being one of the leading countries with uh, companies that actually are fueling and are part of this conflict in the Congo. This is information that's publicly available. So yes, it's very complex. I uh, and I do agree that the Congolese leaders, successive leaders, have been self-serving and have not served the Congolese people. And again, mm -hmm. I think the 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 Congolese leaders, the fit Congolese leaders, uh, right now, the 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 person that's actually showing the most leadership in Congo is not a politician. It's Dr. Mukwege, who continues to push the world and pressure the world to to pursue the crimes documented in the UN mapping report. Once that happens, I can see a lasting peace in the Congo. Yeah. Uh, and and I hope that the, the East African community will listen to him, uh, that the African Union will listen to him. 
uh, last month when he was in Washington, D.C., he met with uh, so many of the, the leading figures in the U.S., including the, the, the first lady who showed up at his event. I hope that the world listens to Dr. Mukwege because that could lead to lasting peace in the Congo and the region. Yeah. He's an amazing gentleman. Uh, Kwesi, as we get closer to the end of our show, uh, what is it that the East African community and the African Union could do to actually make the, the, the situation, the resolution of the conflict between Rwanda and, and uh, DRC, and by extension Uganda, be a model uh, for the continent on how best to resolve conflicts and also to bring uh, you know, peace and uh, even prosperity to a region? I, I think it, it's my sincere uh, hope that uh, more than anything else, they would allow themselves to be a vessel through which these individual member countries of uh, their regional bloc would define for themselves what the conflicts are. That is the starting point. Secondly, I would hope that uh, the East African community would actually continue and, and, and not in any way uh, uh, allow a fatigue to set in uh, on efforts at confidence building. If you look at where Rwanda and uh, the DRC are at right now, uh, it's a great um, a progress uh, considering where they were uh, almost two decades ago. Um, it's building blocks that are only put uh, in place in a sustainable manner through confidence building. I think that the East African community must continue not just simply to build confidence when there is a crisis, but to actually use confidence building mechanisms uh, even when there are those uh, early warning indicators that the parties or the, the, the protagonists in a particular conflict settings are actually experiencing their own fatigue, whereby they might be what is simplified in pedestrian ways uh, to be the hawks those that want to see bloodshed as a solution, uh, the hawks might be prevailing in some of the countries and decision-making structures. Uh, they, they need to continue the, the course of actually making sure that they, they do what I think they've started to do. If they feel that proximity uh, and neighboring countries are too close to the, the, the heat of a, of a conflict situation between mm -hmm. uh, fellow member countries, they could rely on, on the multiple uh, regional bloc memberships. ICAS, Economic Community of Central African States, is an important player in that part of the, of, of the region. And it, it, it's been positive to see the ICJLR being called upon to also play a role. So uh, this is a big elephant. It's an important country. Peace and stability is important for all of us on the continent. And the East African community will be better served if not only they were to humble themselves to listen to the affected member countries and their representatives, and of course, ensure that there is a collaboration between various entities as opposed to competition. Very well put. And on that note, I want to thank our guests, uh, Kwasi Mkibisa, Research Fellow Center for Africa Diplomacy and Leadership University of Johannesburg, Pretoria. And Claude Katebuke is Executive Director, African Great Lakes Action Network. Thanks to our audiences uh, for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. And have a good evening.